people can see. Uh, I decided I would have some slides because I have to say a talk on developing construction contracts for the 21st century is not the subject that most people would like to uh, listen to. In fact, uh, this was prepared as a talk which I was going to give on my master's weekend in Singapore, but I was then going to be followed by Deborah Pullen and by Kevin Hydes, who were going to give lighter topics. Uh, but as some people may know, in Singapore, they love a piece of uh, uh, tough construction law work. Uh, and of course, this evening, uh, we were just about to start, as Andrew has shown through Middle Temple Hall being in the background, our Sir Christopher Wren banquet. And so this is what I would describe as not the speech I would have given at the Sir Christopher Wren banquet, because I don't think anybody would really like to listen to about 35 minutes uh, of this talk. So, I thought I'd put some pictures in uh, just to take us on. You'll see uh, a slight difference between uh, Vitruvius and NEC4. And the history of construction contracts goes back certainly uh, to Vitruvius, who lived from about 80 to 15 BC. Uh, and he said uh, this about uh, construction contracts. He said, contracts for the execution of the works should be drawn with care and precision because without legal flaws, neither party will be able to take advantage of the other. And I think we all know that the history of construction contracts has been that there have been legal flaws in it, and very often one party has taken advantage of the other. And so from about 50 BC when he wrote that, uh, until today, uh, construction contracts have uh, had their problems. Now the need for standard forms I think is well known and the original RABA which then became the JCT, the ICE which has now become the ICC uh, uh, are standard uh, English forms. The first one for building contracts as it was called and the second for civil engineering contracts. Uh, FIDIC is the best known international uh, contract based on the ICE conditions as they were uh, and is now used throughout the world. And when I arbitrate anywhere around the world, it's normally on a FIDIC contract. Uh, and NEC uh, is the one which the ICE brought in to replace uh, the ICE conditions. And NEC 4 has quite a take up in this country and a gradual take up in various other countries around the world. So what are the basic ingredients of a construction contract? Well, they are work, money, and time. Uh, the most important thing to uh, define is the work, because unsurprisingly, if you define the work, uh, the law will step in and tell you what the money and time is if you haven't made an agreement as to those. Uh, most construction contracts become uh, completely overloaded with added obligations in terms of express terms. And if you haven't expressed your term, there will be implied terms in many cases, either at law, such as fitness for purpose uh, under sale of goods, or necessity uh, if you've left something unspoken which should uh, be included. So let's look at claims under construction contracts. Uh, I think some of these will obviously be teaching uh, a few grandmothers to suck eggs uh, around the uh, uh, listeners. Uh, but it's important because when we start to look at the development of new obligations under the contract, uh, one has to remember that time and money are 
of importance under the contract. First thing is time does not equal money uh, under construction contracts. For instance, very often uh, there is an extension of time for inclement weather, but there is no money uh, for periods of inclement weather. So time is there and then extensions of time are there to increase the time. Uh, so that time is a flexible concept under construction uh, contracts. If you don't have an extension of time clause, then you have to complete uh, within the time you're given and you don't get any extensions, with the one exception that if the uh, employer delays a contractor, uh, then the whole time goes and becomes a reasonable time. Very often in contracts, there are obligations for programs, but programs uh, are sometimes very poorly defined in construction contracts. So one has an obligation to complete on time, but the program which sets out the detailed steps to complete is very often not an obligation within the contract. Then money. Uh, very often they are expressed terms which will give you an entitlement. For instance, if the uh, employer doesn't give the contractor possession of the site. Uh, and there will also be the possibility of an alternative claim for breach. If the contractor is not given possession of the site by the employer, the employer will be in breach. Uh, and there will be either breach of an express or implied term leading to damages. Very often there are complex notice provisions uh, leading to uh, the need to give a notice before you can get either time or money. Uh, and the question is whether those are conditions precedent, meaning if they're not complied with, you don't get any time or money, or whether they are just directory in nature. Now risks under construction contracts are uh, important um, there are different types of obligation. There are absolute obligations and best endeavour obligations. Okay, so um, let me just go through a few of the slides. If you've not seen them, you won't um, know what I was talking about. There is Vitruvius's book, and uh, that's his 10 books, in fact, uh, produced uh, originally in about uh, 50 BC. And there was the NEC. I've referred to the history of construction contracts and the need for standard forms. I've talked about basic ingredients of work, money, and time, added obligations, express and implied. Uh, claims under construction contracts. So I, I did add these pictures in, so I thought uh, there was some uh, interest I had to add in. And then I deal with claims under construction contracts, the time and money, time does not equal money, time and extensions of time, time without extensions of time, time and program, express terms with entitlement and breach of uh, express or implied terms, uh, notices and conditions precedent. And then we look at risks under the contract. Uh, and uh, there are absolute obligations and best endeavour obligations. So that where a party takes something and says it's an absolute obligation on their part, uh, by and large, they have to uh, perform that. Uh, and where there is uh, a risk, then I'm afraid that generally it is the contractor who takes the risk. Now we've heard recently of a lot about uh, force majeure uh, and obviously in the past each time we've had some sort of major risk coming up uh, somebody's added in uh, that as a risk under a contract sometimes the employer's taken it uh, sometimes there's been a supplement for it depending on whether the uh, contractor or the uh, employer takes it but if one looks at uh, the force majeure uh, generally, under forms of contract, sometimes there is just the word force majeure, and that's under 
Clause 2.29 of the JCT, they just call it force majeure. Under, uh, for instance, uh, the ICC contract, uh, they actually define force majeure and they describe it under that contract as any circumstances outside the control of either party, not attributable to the default of either party, which arises during the currency of the contract, and these are the difficult words, which renders it impossible or illegal for either party to fulfill its contractual obligation. So you either have a pure just force majeure, nobody defines it, but if you define it, as you can see there, it, it's not a very helpful definition uh, because uh, it's difficult to see how in the current situation, anything has been rendered impossible. Uh, but uh, if you are in a contract where you've just got force majeure, uh, which is a very common risk, then you'll be looking to Mr. Justice McCarty in 1920, who said these words, force majeure, the term is used with reference to all circumstances independent of the will of man, and which it is not in his power to control. Thus war, inundations, and epidemics are cases of force majeure. It has even been decided that a strike of workmen constitutes a case of force majeure. So that one can see that there are normal employer risks, such as possession of the site, there is employer's fault, there's war, civil war, Rebellion, insurrection, military or is user power, strikes, riots, and civil commotion, not confined to the contractor's employees. So you've got to have one extra person, not just the contractor's employees, uh, who is rioting or striking or committing civil commotion. Uh, radioactive contamination is one which was added in uh, about 20 years ago and more recently terrorism and i think after this pandemic uh, we will see whether people now define force majeure uh, in a different way or whether they add in a pandemic or an epidemic uh, as part of that insurance against risk clearly under all contracts the important thing is to insure against risk one of the greatest risks uh, under contracts is design risk, uh, and who uh, bears design risk. Traditional contracts, it's often been the employer through his architect or engineer who's taken it. Uh, where you then have design and build, it, it can uh, float around. There can be a design responsibility before the construction contract is let, novated contract. Uh, and by and large, uh, and even in the uh, Supreme Court recently, uh, design risk and whether it's fitness for purpose, whether it's reasonable skill and care, and who bears it, uh, are one of, uh, form one of the major areas uh, of contention as to risk. Now let's look at some developing obligations. Uh, the first one, is cooperation and partnering. Now you would have thought uh, that cooperation and partnering would be something which was familiar. Uh, but of course, uh, one of our uh, former members, uh, Michael Latham, uh, in his report on constructing the team, uh, introduced uh, a different uh, viewpoint uh, to the way in which people uh, should uh, perform contracts and so there was then uh, a perhaps a touchy-feely obligation for the contractor, uh, the employer, the project manager uh, all to uh, come together and uh, act in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. Now, one of the difficulties, and this was included then in NEC and it's now in NEC 4, is knowing precisely 
uh, when there's a breach of that obligation. And so a lot of uh, modern contract wording has more something aspirational uh, than actually some hard and fast ability to say the person is in breach. Have they not acted in a spirit of mutual trust? Uh, what would be a breach of that obligation? Equally, uh, acting in good faith. Uh, in English law, we've tended to say parties should act reasonably in all the circumstances. Uh, but uh, continental Europe uh, and the Napoleonic Code and civil, uh, civilian law jurisdictions have the concept of good faith uh, and that has come now much more into uh, obligations under contracts. And in particular with PFI contracts, uh, the courts have been more willing uh, to say that there has to be some degree of uh, good faith obligation in the, obliga in the performance of those contracts. I think another change in the developing obligations has been proactive management. Uh, certainly when a number of us started uh, looking around the uh, room uh, in construction, uh, it was a continual battle between the contractor uh, and the uh, supervising staff, whether architect, engineer, project manager. Uh, but one and everything tended to get shunted off to the end and one had the mother of all pieces of litigation or arbitration. Uh, but the change has uh, certainly now uh, come and it's, it's marked uh, both by the development of the NEC and the Latham uh, uh, attitude which was brought into construction to have more proactive management, uh, early warnings uh, have to be given when something happens in advance of putting in the claim and then you have meetings to try and work out how to deal with that point uh, and then assessment. Another uh, aspect which has come in uh, is dispute avoidance. And many of you may have been involved in uh, London 2012 uh, Olympics. Uh, and there was, uh, I know Bob Heathfield was involved in it. Uh, there was uh, a, a dispute avoidance uh, panel set up uh, in order to avoid dispute. And I think it's quite interesting philosophically uh, when something is not a dispute but is an issue on which the parties don't quite agree. Uh, and what one tries to do is to resolve that uh, before it gets to a dispute. And so it's a creative way of getting right in there at the beginning uh, and resolving it by dispute avoidance. Uh, dispute resolution has developed uh, over the uh, years. Uh, there are very few contracts now which don't have some form of mediation or ADR to try and resolve the dispute. I think uh, when a number of us looking around the room started, it was either arbitration or litigation uh, after an engineer's decision under a, a ICE conditions uh, or after some decision by the architect under the RIBA or the JCT form. Uh, but dispute resolution now has uh, mediation or some other form of ADR. Uh, dispute boards are very common uh, and the modern uh, within the past few years, we now have dispute, uh, both avoidance uh, and adjudication board, so that they are there to avoid disputes. And I'm currently uh, on a major one uh, where we haven't had any disputes which haven't been uh, yet avoided. Uh, and uh, by negotiating at an early stage, uh, one manages to resolve it. And of course, as a result of Latham, uh, we have adjudication. Uh, adjudication has spread like a rash around the world, uh, so that it started obviously here in the UK. Uh, gradually, it spread to Ireland, but it's spread 
uh, throughout the world uh, and uh, Singapore, uh, form of it in Australia, uh, Malaysia, uh, and uh, it's also now spread to Canada uh, where Ontario has taken it in and it's likely to spread to all of the Canadian provinces. Uh, even where there isn't uh, adjudication uh, by statute, uh, parties have now adopted it. So that in Hong Kong, for instance, and in South Africa, uh, a good number of construction contracts have included adjudication, although it's not a statutory scheme. Now the two ones I'm going to spend uh, a little time on are building information modeling and environmental performance and sustainability. And the reason for that is these are the ones uh, which in Singapore are causing uh, more excitement uh, than anything else. Uh, and so those were to form the part of it. So BIM or uh, building information modeling, uh, what is it? Uh, well, it is, uh, has some basic principles which are uh, you have an appointing party, a lead appointed party, and an appointed party. And by and large, the appointing party is the um, employer. The lead appointed party is then the lead consultant. And then the appointed parties are anybody who else who is appointed uh, under the contract. And the important thing is to get uh, BIM to work, you've got to incorporate the same terms in all contracts. So there's a mutuality in operating a BIM. Uh, and uh, what you've got to decide is whether it overrides all other contractual obligations or whether uh, the contracts take precedence, in which case uh, you get more disputes. But the whole purpose of building information uh, modeling is so that instead of everybody going off into their separate bunkers and uh, forming their own designs separately and then trying to coordinate that with everybody else uh, and doing so, I have to say, uh, badly. I think we've all had experience of uh, clash uh, checking uh, by um, m and contractors, and I know it's the bane of structural and uh, consultants that they've just designed all their reinforcement when the m and consultant comes along and says, I would like a, a hole 600 by 600 through that beam. And so the idea of uh, building information modeling is to have a project model which everybody participates in producing uh, and uh, therefore uh, prevents the sort of lack of coordination uh, which is uh, rife in the construction industry. Now the key obligations are the information particulars. It's got to establish all the necessary details of what information is to be produced, when, how, by whom, to whom, at what level of detail, to what standard, and in what form. Now, I think one can see uh, that when you start to have to coordinate a lot of people, you have to give thought to those aspects which are normally ignored. Uh, for instance, uh, very often information in the past is produced in the form in which the person wants to uh, and it's before is provided uh, at a time they want to. But one has uh, to have information in particular order in order to put together uh, a building information model. You have to have the common in data environment. You've got to describe what the software is uh, the processes for accessing and providing data to that, uh, and what is the necessary technology. And all of this has to be within uh, the contractual obligations. Uh, material. 
you've got to say what is the material being provided? Is it drawings, calculations, specification which are being provided? And in the end, you've got to describe the information model, which is the product of all of this. Uh, and the parties have to comply, and it's a mutual obligation to comply uh, with the applicable information particulars. Now, what are some of the developing problems? Uh, you still have to resolve omissions, ambiguities, conflict, or inconsistencies in BIM. And the question is, who resolves them and what are the consequences? Uh, the advantage of BIM is that obviously you can see what the omissions, ambiguities, conflicts, or inconsistencies are because somebody is controlling the information coming in and they can see what it is. But at the bottom of it, you still need to decide how to resolve it and who resolves it, uh, and what are the consequences, for instance, in terms of extensions of time or additional costs, if one party is affected by it. You also have complex intellectual property rights. Who owns the intellectual property rights in the information model and the material in the information model uh, because it is an amalgam of various uh, people's input and sometimes uh, through discussion things are changed uh, and the question particularly for instance if it's a particular architectural feature uh, and it has been altered uh, by conversations to avoid conflicts or inconsistencies, uh, who uh, then owns the IPR in that part of the model. And very often also you've got to define the permitted purpose. For what purpose can you use the model? Uh, and very often, uh, obviously it is used during the construction process, uh, but I think a lot of us have had that uh, terrible position where at the end of a project there have to be as-built drawings produced. And I think a number of us have had the disaster where the uh, as-built drawings you're given have no relationship uh, to the building which has been built. Uh, but the advantage, of course, of a BIM model is that you produce a model of what you're building and it reflects uh, the built model and therefore one of the permitted purposes is to use it uh, for uh, the life of the uh, building. Amendments and modifications uh, to the uh, IPR. Who has the right to make amendments or modifications? That's another indication of some of the complexities which have to be dealt with under contractual obligations. And then there is liability for the information. Accuracy of data, obviously the party providing the data. But very often, as we know, when you send a file, it can either itself be corrupted or when you add it in to the software, lo and behold, it says uh, you have corrupted the model. Uh, and liability for the corruption of the model is a major concern uh, because you have your model uh, there uh, and somebody adds in what they think is one additional pipe and the whole model turns into a a uh, lot of gobbledygook, as we often get when you try and open something in PDF which hasn't properly been downloaded. Uh, breach of IPR. And then security requirements. Uh, who is allowed access to the model and what are they allowed to do to it? Uh, resolution of conflicts. So the clash check just has to take place. And of course, there's always the question of who gets any extension of time or additional cost 
because of it. So you can see, I think, uh, that BIM modeling uh, is uh, an essential part, but it's a very complex additional set of obligations uh, which are being added uh, to the parties, mainly because construction contracts generally are a series of bunkers, and here we are producing something uh, which is central to the project. Now, the second developing obligation is environmental performance and sustainability. And there are uh, many ways in which these are being added to contracts. And sometimes they are purely aspirational obligations so that one party has to assist in exploring ways to reduce uh, carbon emissions, to reduce uh, water usage. Uh, and uh, when those are there, again, the question of enforcement of them is difficult. But uh, for most contracts, uh, what one is trying to define is areas of uh, if not responsibility, uh, areas in which one party is trying to assist another. And I think lawyers don't like aspirational obligations because they are difficult to say whether that person has ex assisted properly in exploring ways. Uh, but for the people operating on the ground, uh, they normally know what that means. And then there are also fixed obligations, do something in a particular way, or meet a target, for instance, uh, to have net zero carbon in a building. And the areas in which these obligations are often imposed is first of all in setting the design parameters, uh, secondly in selection of products or materials, then in the adoption of construction techniques, the approach to the construction process, and then both in the construction, and I think most importantly, in the operational phases. And so what are the types of obligation? Well, energy consumption and use of renewable energy. Very often, there is a specification of energy uh, consumption. Uh, a few years ago, and it's a reported case, I had uh, a modern building uh, where they had uh, really no need for any heating because it was air conditioned throughout the year. Uh, and the wet, because it was so well insulated, the heat source was by and large laptops and uh, desktops, uh, which were le left on during uh, the day and the occupant produced the heat but somebody had used a specification which had been used to the old heating and cooling, and it found that in winter, the temperature had to be uh, cooled to a lower temperature because the winter temperature, uh, I forget what the figure was, but it was something like in winter it had to be 18, and in summer it had to be 22. So you had to cool it to 22 in summer, but to 18 in winter under the obligation, or so it was thought uh, in terms of the obligation. So you've got to be careful adapting old technology to new technology in terms of that. Water harvesting, mains water consumption, CO2 emissions, and the intensity of CO uh, emissions uh, per square meter of the building materials from non-renewable sources, vehicle movements, biodiversity, ecologically uh, uh, valuable habitat, whole life performance. Uh, and this gets into where there are very uh, great difficulties in saying what will be the performance in terms particularly of energy consumption over the whole life of a building, say of 50 or 60 years. And also, what will be the whole life costs and the end of life costs, uh, including end of life costs? In other words, if you've designed a building which can only be taken down 
uh, by uh, de-stressing it uh, on the way down because it's all pre-stressed, the end of life cost may be a very appreciable amount of the whole life costs of that building. Enforcement of the obligation. Obviously, if you've got particular targets and you don't meet them, there'll be a breach and you have damages. Very often you have key performance indicators, KPIs, uh, and liquidated damages are applied if you don't meet those uh, KPIs. Uh, but what uh, one finds uh, time and again is uh, when you come to a dispute in a contract is that the parties never quite came to terms on the KPIs. Uh, where you're trying to negotiate a contract in a short time, you can see that somebody who says, well, tell us what the whole life costs are and set a KPI for the performance of those whole life costs over a year of the building and tell us what you will give us as liquidated damages for failure to comply with that KPI are the sort of obligations which can take a year to negotiate uh, for parties. And if you're dealing with that uh, on a lot of obligations, I think you can see that that's one of the major difficulties of these developing obligations uh, for the 21st century. And then of course, if there are carbon impacts, there's offsetting and who pays the cost of offsetting those uh, under the terms of the contract. Now we move on to the last area, which is smart contracts. Uh, I think uh, we're now used, obviously, to AI uh, coming in into various parts of our life. And now most uh, large major uh, construction contracts around the world have a digital project management document system so that paper is no longer used uh, and everything is done uh, on a document management system from making claims to the assessment of claims uh, and nobody has a hard copy. Uh, that uh, obviously can cause difficulties uh, and I've had certainly a case uh, where for some reason uh, the digital system uh, wasn't maintained after the end of the contract uh, and a lot of documentation was lost uh, and uh, thousands of pounds were spent uh, trying to uh, find uh, a uh, status at an earlier time uh, of the whole system. Uh, and I might just mention that if you're uh, thinking of specifying anything, for heaven's sake, uh, make sure there are monthly saves, both on the building information modeling and also on the digital project document system so that you have something you can go back to. Uh, and very often they are just developed as they go. Automated construction methods. Uh, in terms of making contracts smarter, uh, in terms of construction, then I think off-site fabrication, and particularly in social distancing times, uh, makes it uh, a, a new development. Uh, and um, as uh, we uh, had Robert Mayer and the Hub uh, initiative, where various universities are getting together uh, to ensure that off-site fabrication uh, becomes a must in, in terms of consideration in saving uh, a lot of uh, cost on site and also it forms part of the sustainability. On site 3D printing. Uh, I certainly have seen a demonstration of a house made out of concrete where all somebody did was to put in a program into a concrete spraying machine and it made a house. I have to say, it wasn't a house I think most of us would like to live in, but it, it showed what can be done uh, without having construction workers. Uh, and I think uh, when you think of the 
a brick being put on top of a brick in a mortar bed or, or a block being put on top of a block in a mortar bed, uh, then uh, on-site 3D printing of a building uh, is uh, certainly something uh, which is being developed. Now, the replacement of the project manager with AI, uh, that's one of the uh, great questions as to whether we can replace, dare I say it, lawyers uh, and engineers and everybody else with AI. And the particular area is obviously uh, assessing extensions of time and claims by some form of smart assessment. And when you think about it, uh, somebody makes an extension of time, uh, by and large it is the delay which has been caused, and then it is an extension of time to say what the impact of that delay is likely to be on the completion of the contract, which all to uh, people uh, who are programmers will seem like a few logical steps for which you can convert the obligation to code. But for instance, uh, there is in certification a degree of discretion. And one of the difficulties, uh, as uh, Mr. Uh, Musk has found, uh, is uh, the programming of cars to have the sort of discretionary reactions the human mind has uh, and how difficult that is in practice. But in theory, uh, by setting up a number of tests of how people do certify, uh, you could uh, do that. Obviously, if it's straightforward certification, of x cubic meters of concrete at so much a cubic meter. Uh, that is easy. But certification, particularly in the areas of extension of time and assessment of claims, often has uh, more to it. Then reasonableness. Uh, I mentioned good faith as well, because these are two sets of obligations which very often are very touchy-feely and the question of converting those obligations to code. But I should say that this is work in progress. The whole of the possibility of converting obligations under contract to code it is something which is uh, being considered. And we have a lot of transactional technologies at present uh, very often, it's in the banking and settlement of claims or transactions, for instance, share transactions uh, and other transactions, which are automatically transferred from one bank account to another bank account with a series of coded steps in between. Uh, and at present, uh, with both uh, blockchain and transactional technologies, there are a number of studies, and I know there's one person, Anna Midgley, uh, who is looking in, who will be glad that I've mentioned it, but it is a, a, uh, a challenge, but a challenge which is being met, of converting uh, the obligations, and the way in which we manage construction contracts into a smarter set of transactional technologies. So in conclusion, I think one can say that construction contracts themselves have developed little in the two, past 2,000 years, uh, and many obligations have stood for centuries. Uh, but we do have new obligations which arise from the digital age and from climate change and perhaps from pandemics. And most contracts in construction contracts are still hard copy documents with wet signatures. 
But I think the challenge is that we now have the opportunity to make the contracts digital and smart. Are we going to do that? And if we do, will it help smooth the construction or the legal processes? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sir Vivian. Our first question is from Mike Parrott. Mike Parrott? Yes, Mike. Sorry, Craig, I thought you were going to read it from the chat. So I'll just go into the chat. Sorry, I, I couldn't quite. I... Of the question. I've lost chat now. Where Sorry, I don't think I could quite put the question the same way as you. So I thought be... Oh, right. No. <laughs> uh, I'll, try, I'll try and abbreviate because it, it's quite lengthy. Uh, I think one of the, one of the uh, from somebody who's been approaching uh, construction from the sort of opposite end of the scale, which is uh, investigating building failure for most of my life, um, you know, we, we learn quite a lot out of failure. And one of the, the things that comes up time and time again out of failure is this um, abrogation almost of responsibility, of professional responsibility um, to what uh, a new book that I have in mind is that leave it to one man and his dog in Chelmsford, um, if you understand my meaning. So we see, um, we see in our investigation systemic failure um, arising out of a process where, for example, um, and I know we've got a couple of architects online, I can see Ian there chugging away. How many architects, for example, would take responsibility for drainage design? Very rare in my humble opinion, but one man and his dog in Chelmsford is quite happy to take that responsibility. And when it all goes wrong, um, our friend in Chelmsford is nowhere to be seen, hasn't got the means or the financial robustness to be able to, um, to take the hit, so to speak. And, yeah. and I think there is this, um, uh, what, what I'm really alluding to is that there needs to be a kind of interdisciplinary approach and the responsibility needs to be gathered back in to the spectrum of professionals rather than this abrogation of professional responsibility. I just yep. wondered if you had a view on that. Well, I think, I think two things. One is uh, building information modeling in, is there to try and do that. So that in fact, the, you can't just say, oh, we've got about the uh, drainage. You've got to have it as part of that. And somebody has to be uh, made responsible for it. Uh, but of course, building information modeling at present is only really viable for larger medium or medium projects. And so very often for small projects, it isn't there. Uh, but for many, many years, and indeed uh, Michael Latham was, was involved in it, uh, what one's been trying to do is to have uh, project insurance, uh, which lasts for 10 years, as it does in France, for major defects which occur, precisely because of that, uh, to avoid having to find somebody responsible in order to try and get money. And by the time you've done that, very often you find the person responsible hasn't got the money and therefore you can't do it. So I would say that this building information mo modeling is, is a step in the right direction. Mm. But I think underlying, as I said, risks, very often insurance of risks is the only way of, of proceeding. There, there was a, a kind of a, a part two to the question, which uh, to my question, which comes later, uh, right. which, is, which is my concern over, um, a lot of architects and a lot of chartered building surveyors will probably uh, work on buildings that exist as opposed to new builds. And we have uh, uh, an increasing drive on retrofit 
solutions, and I'm not thinking actually of Grenville uh, at all in this. Um, and what I'm seeing is the application of retrofit solutions to buildings that improves the carbon footprint. And I'm seeing consequential problems arising at, in the indoor climate um, where we're getting you know, higher increases of mold and dampness and all those sorts of issues. And um, you know, how we can um, bring those to account through contracts in such scenarios, because I don't think this has been very well visited. Well, I mean, that's another area of BIM, because if you've got a BIM, you've actually got uh, the means by which once you do any works to that, mm. you've got a model which you can update. Uh, and with a lot of modeling techniques which are coming in now, they allow you to see what is going to be the consequence in terms of condensation, in terms of, uh, yeah. because you apply various um, uh, programs to the model uh, to uh, design it. And I think one, the, the problem very often with retrofitting is not quite knowing what you're retrofitting to, uh, besides obviously the problem of retrofitting in, in its own. I think my final comment on that, I think you're quite right. Uh, BIM is, um, is uh, I think, a major part of the solution. Um, the, 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 the worry and concern is who is inputting into the BIM, but yeah. maybe for another time. <laughs> Thanks, Vivian. Good. Um, our next question is from Stuart Owen. Stuart Owen. Stuart's in the pub. Yeah, no, it's all right, mate. Thanks, good evening. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. It's a sort of an add-on to what Mike was saying just now, actually. It, um, uh, one of the things that uh, you alluded to in your conversation, or your presentation, Ruben, is that, um, of course, it's all about where risk lies, and uh, the general trend with risk has been to push it further and further down the uh, supply chain, so that design responsibility and all risk moves from main contractor to subcontractor and subcontractor to subcontractor. Uh, uh, one of the interesting questions I'd like to ask your opinion about is that can you see any mechanism by which that can ever come back up again? Because I can't see architects, engineers, main contractors ever taking on more risk. And more importantly, I probably can't see their insurers taking on more risk. Um, so it's an interesting question as to whether or not the, uh, the industry itself will ever see a, a swing the other way, that uh, risk might be something that is shared amongst the design team again. Because I can't, I can't see any insurers giving, I mean, I know for a fact now that some design professionals are finding it almost impossible to get reasonably priced insurance on PLA, for example. Yeah. Well, I, th I think, uh, as you say, that, that follows on to some extent from, from Mike's point of view. Um, uh, and uh, that's why the alternative of a uh, project insurance uh, it, to uh, deal with particular risks uh, is one which I think has uh, widely been uh, considered. What very often is, is the problem is that uh, matters fall between stools in terms of risk. Because, I mean, in, in uh, and this is why, to some extent, the exercise which is being done with BIM uh, of taking people who are in bunkers with gaps between them and trying to put everybody together so that everything has to be produced by somebody uh, is, uh, I think, a move in the right direction. Um, the, the, the problem I think uh, we, we've got is that everybody goes for the cheapest solution and therefore they 
tend to subcontract it down to the nth degree. Uh, and, uh, but in, in strictness, uh, if the person at the top of the chain is still there, it doesn't matter if all the others have gone, uh, then they retain liability for that. But it is a matter of properly uh, defining that liability in the first place. I think it's an interesting question that um, when I was a main contractor, which was um, most of the time I spent in fit out and refurbishment, again, Mike, uh, you know, uh, my understanding is something like ninety-five percent of all construction happens in existing stock, so it's it's only high, you know, high-level um, projects. But when I used to see risk, I used to think risk was opportunity. It was not a, a chance to take risk on board, uh, price it into the, the submission, and then go right. I can I can manage the risk and make money with it. And yet, what seems to now happen is that professional teams got wise to this and has told all clients, well. Go for the cheapest option because the idiot that's likely to have not priced the risk in but has taken the risk on is the one that you're going to employ. It, it seems, it seems yeah. poor advice, but it seems you're, you're nodding. I, I'm yeah, well, I, they're, they're too they're too difficult. It's always about risk. Uh, first of all, uh, assessing risk is extremely difficult, uh, and um, you know if you're an insurer, uh, you might be able to say that if you've got a massive portfolio. You can take a hit if one project has subsidence, but not all or whatever. Uh, and so taking, uh, by and large, people are bad at assessing risk. Uh, and I have to say, uh, modern risk assessments uh, are a, a good example of how uh, we do a lot on risk assessment, uh, but all of my experience is the problems have come from risks which aren't being assessed at all. And in the past, you would only have to have assessed whose risk it was. Now you have to go through risk assessment, and very often you have to say, the person should have put it in their risk assessment but failed to do, uh, or they didn't properly assess the risk in their risk assessment. <laughs> and so I think, risk is something which is very little understood uh, and we produce a lot of risk assessments which i think are of dubious quality certainly when they come uh, to litigation or arbitration i agree, I agree. thank you sir. any more any more for any more any more questions from anybody i see i've assumed we don't clap this evening at eight o'clock <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> No, uh, we, we clapped you. <laughs> <laughs> no, for the, the carers. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's a sort of, uh, everyone decided 10 weeks was, was enough, I think. Uh, um. Would you uh, like to put a toast to absent friends, Sir Vivian? Yeah, so I'm sure, uh, obviously, in this time of uh, pandemic, uh, we all have um a lot of people who would have been at the sir christopher m banquet this evening and so all of you have got a glass i'm afraid i haven't uh but all of those who have got a glass will you raise it to all members of the company absent friends absent friends absent, absent friends. friends the company absent friends. <laughs> henry what are you on <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Where are you, Henry? Can't hear you. You're on mute, Henry. You're on mute. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm there. Florence at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Magic roundabout. What? A magic roundabout. That, that's right. <laughs> I, I can spin it out to anywhere I like, actually. <laughs> I'd not do that one though. I get into trouble. <laughs> there you go. Have that. <laughs> so uh, moving forward, uh, next week Stuart's going to be hosting the virtual and informal networking events, and the week after, uh, Rebecca Thompson, who's on online, is going to uh, be giving a talk on archaeology Hi, and buildings. I don't know if she wanted to give a brief 
um, synopsis on, on it now? Uh, well, you're all welcome. Inspired, I've got to say, by, by Mike. Um, I've gone back to university and I'm doing a master's in archaeology of buildings and I'm really happy to share that with you uh, in doing my analysis and interpretation of uh, some historic buildings. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Excellent. Well, sorry to interrupt you there, but um, if I may, that's interesting because we've got quite a lot of um, old builders in the group. Oh, you said old buildings, sorry. I didn't... <laughs> 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 just, just very briefly, if I may, Craig, uh, so thank you for mentioning next week. The uh, Vine meeting uh, will be convening as per, per usual. Um, we've, uh, I think we've circulated a list of uh, some thoughts about the idea. We, we may be trying a breakout room within the event just to see if we can make it work. So for the more technically adventurous of you, it'd be quite interesting to get a few volunteers to say, yes, I'll see if I can make that work. But uh, thank you for mentioning it. Right, that's, that's it everyone. Thank you for coming. And thank, thank you, you all, thank, thank you, Master. That was very enlightening. Well, thank, thank you, you And uh, it's only, I'm only sorry we're not on the lawns of Singapore or in Middle Temple Hall, yeah. except for Andrew. <laughs> thank you, Vivian. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yes. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs> oh, fantastic. Is this work?